It's time for your weekly visit with America's favorite economic and financial commentator for the past 32 years. This is Louis Rukeyser's Wall Street. Brought to you in part by Occidental Petroleum. From exploring for new oil and natural gas resources to striving to protect the environment, Occidental Petroleum is bringing a new energy to energy solutions. And by Oppenheimer Funds. What makes a true champion? The ability to prepare with discipline, to perform with passion, to compete with determination. Again and again. Oppenheimer Funds, the right way to invest. And by A.G. Edwards, providing a full range of personalized financial, retirement, and estate planning services. A.G. Edwards, trusted advice, exceptional service. Tonight, Lou's panelists are Mary Farrell, Laszlo Barini, and Bob Stovall. His special guest tonight is Jean-Marie Eviard, Portfolio Manager of the First Eagle Sojin Funds. Now, here's Louis Rukeyser. Good evening and welcome back. You may have noticed this yourself, especially lately, but Wall Street has never exactly been a man for all seasons. Or, as it turns out, a bull or a bear for all seasons either. It is, in fact, an inconsistent little dickens. And much that is said and believed about seasonality in the financial markets has a tendency to stop working the very first time you start putting your money on it. Take that old chestnut about the inevitability of a big annual summer rally. Well, not exactly. Or in the other direction, take all that dire talk we were hearing just one month ago about the perennial awfulness of October. Many a gloomster cackling over his financial calendar confidently assured us that October 1929 and October 1987, among other grim Halloween markets, were about to meet their eerie match in the great crash of October 2002. You betcha. Turns out that October 2002 was a perfectly splendid month for investors. Not only the biggest October gain ever for the S&P 500, more than 19%, but the biggest gain the Dow has registered in any month in nearly 16 years. If that's what they call predictable seasonality in Wall Street, make mine nutmeg and ginger not to mention more than a few grains of salt. November got off to a good start today, too, partly because of the very inconsistency that is the genuine nature of investor psychology. The economic news in headline areas like jobs and manufacturing was weak, but significantly not too weak, or for that matter, as weak as most of the resident geniuses had been predicting. It was, however, sufficiently weak to create overwhelming support for the belief that the Federal Reserve will resume cutting interest rates next week. Now, if you have a long memory, which in Wall Street means you are able to retain things that happened more than two weeks ago, you may recall that we were told for much of this year that the stock market wouldn't like it if the Fed cut rates again since that would raise fears that the economy was in even worse shape than generally believed and that we were plunging headlong into a double dip recession. That was then, this is now. Now the predominant feeling and what passes for the conventional wisdom in those precincts is that the economy, while still disappointingly sluggish, actually is showing unmistakable signs of improvement with the stock market trailing, albeit timidly, behind, but that one more electric shock treatment from the Fed will not just assure future progress on both fronts, but will encourage more aggressive corporate buying of long-neglected capital goods, like semiconductors. And as a nice little bonus, it might keep the record housing boom going too. So that's this week's reasoning in the fickle forests of finance. Stay tuned. 
But who would have thought that the sun would begin to shine again with such an utter disregard for the supposedly immutable seasonality of the Wall Street calendar? We tonight will talk with a guest who not only has always disregarded the seasonal changes of temperament in Wall Street, but has lately been a leader of the pack in both global and gold investing. But first, let's check out the flock of fluctuators. And as the Dow Jones Industrial Average indicates, stocks which rose for five straight weeks, then fell for six, have now risen again for four. A display of fickleness that would have shamed Britney Spears. The latest upturn in investor confidence lifted all boats, led by the technology-dominated NASDAQ, which is now at its highest level since August. Bonds strengthened again this week, but the fall in long-term rates was checked today when the ghouls decided that the economy, while weak, simply wasn't weak enough, darn it, to justify more than a quarter point cut by the Fed next week. But the combination of listless economic news and likely lower interest rates sent the dollar down, briefly below par with the euro for the first time in more than three months. And gold climbed back over $319 an ounce, a three-week high. And if you still think the world never changes at all, know that Russian President Vladimir Putin is turning into a sex symbol which is not the usual fate of former KGB spies. A hit song on Russian radio by what is described as a racy all-girl band contains the once unlikely line, and now I want a man like Putin. Britney Spears, eat your heart out. Mary Fowl, what song are you singing these days? <laughs> <laughs> well, a much happier song. It's wonderful to see the strength in October. And I think it's fair to say the worst is behind us. The bottoming of the market, the process is well underway. I think we'll continue to see a lot of volatility. But clearly investors are feeling a lot more confident in buying stocks. A lot of people say they've heard that song before. Why is this time really going to be the bottom? I think that, and again, we always have the risk that there could be some event that drives us below uh, the lows uh, uh, that's out there. But I think that what we're seeing here is really a gradual strengthening in the economy, gradually strengthening earnings, uh, rates and inflation both remain low to support higher stock prices. But I think the key issue is that the third quarter earnings are the first ones that investors are able to hold on to. They are gains, not spectacular gains by any means, uh, but they are gains the first quarter and eight quarters we've seen that. And honest gains. Honest gains this time. I think that uh, that having these CEOs having to certify those statements did give some confidence. So what what would you buy now? I think given the volatility, I'd still be somewhat cautious, but I think the global picture looks pretty good. A company like Colgate, uh, which UBS does have an investment banking relationship, but Colgate Palmolive has been showing very good earnings gains, much better than its competition. Uh, financial services are way down and out, but there's some stellar gems there. Uh, Fifth Third Bank Corp, which we also make a market in, uh, I think is doing very well. And then finally, for those uh, bargain hunters out there, uh, TJX uh, and uh, off-price shopping is, is also defying the odds of consumer spending. And do you have a relationship with them, too? No. Nope. Well, just a personal one, not a business <laughs> one. <laughs> do, you, do you own those stocks, too? Uh, no. Okay, so uh, at this stage, what would you sell? I'd look very carefully at both the telecom and utilities groups. And the reason why is, yes, there are some bargain hunting ideas there, and I think some people are going to make some smart money in that, that, but both those industries suffer from a lot of overcapacity, a lot of problems, and a lot of those companies, I think, will bear the brunt of that with lower stock prices. But basically, you think October will be followed by another good month or two, at least, huh? Yes, I think so. And I th again, volatile, but direction should be up here. Lazo Brini, when you were last with us in August 9th, you said we had bottomed. In fact, we did go a little lower after that. Do you want to revise your estimate? No, I uh, can't time the market that well, and I was wrong, but uh, I'm still very comfortable with the uh, uh, conclusion we reached. I've said that I thought the healing process began in July. There seems to have been uh, the underpinnings even in September were, were a little better than they'd been in July. Uh, you feel we've made the bottom? I do. I think that we got uh, the sentiment especially got uh, overdone. Um, and uh, that and some other indicators tell me that we have indeed uh, made a bottom. What are some of the indicators? Well, 
one is that we see buying in the European stocks. When in July, the Europeans sold on the rally. Uh, and the only uh, real indicator we found that tells us we're in the ninth inning of a bear market is when the public starts shorting more than do the member firms. And that's been happening as well. You told us last time that you thought this market was becoming much more short-term oriented. Do you still believe that, and how should that affect investors? Well, it is. Uh, the time horizon of the market is now three to six months, and uh, I think investors have to be willing to take profits, and uh, taxes uh, have to be a side light. You don't think we're ever going to have the buy and hold come back? No, because I think the rule changes in terms of decimalization and uh, especially Reg FD uh, have just created a lot of short-term potential vol uh, volatility. Why decimalization and Reg FD, fair disclosure, well, why have they hurt long-term investors? Because corporations now are more willing to come out more quickly. In the uh, years 1990 to 95, we averaged 40 earning warnings a year. Last two years, we've averaged 2,000. So it's very dangerous to have a long-term horizon because one one bad number can almost sink the ship. Well, with with my warning that these nothing is endorsed by the management, what would you buy these days? Well, what I am buying are things like Mary Express, uh, Dow Chemical, Fannie Mae, and I'm trying to decide which of the tech stocks uh, to buy because I think the tech stocks are going to come on very strong here. Why are they suddenly looking better? They've clearly in October, NASDAQ looked a lot better. Why do you think the tech stocks are picking up so much? I think people are willing to look ahead. I think there are some people who, who feel that uh, the news has been so bad that uh, there's got to be some ray of hope. And you've had some companies uh, like IBM, which have kind of good numbers. And the actual spark to this whole rally might have been Yahoo. When they reported uh, more upbeat than expected. The, and the next day, the market began to rally. And what would you sell? I'd still be leery of the smaller uh, NASDAQ tech stocks, um, the ones which uh, there's just an awful lot of uh, hope rather than reality. Bob Stovall, you've seen more bear markets than the average uh, fella. Mm -hmm. Are we out of this one? Oh, I think we are. I think October 9 was the bottom, and uh, we've leaped up, uh, leaped up from there in the uh, Dow and the S&P and NASDAQ to such a degree that even if we do have some soggy days, you know, there's an old saying that the, the bears sometimes have Thanksgiving, but the bulls almost always have Christmas. And that could happen, but still we're not going to make a lower low. And I think uh, even though you just beat up on the seasonality, we have some things going for us in terms of the election and the third year of president cycles, which are usually quite good. I just said that October wasn't quite as terrible as some people have said. In fact, as, as you all know, uh, September has a worse record than October. That's right. It's the worst month of the year. October is either second or third. But what I was getting at, that these by-election years, such as right now, usually the November, December, are strong months. And the third year of the president's term, which is the, the year after, is almost always strong. Let's hear your buy recommendations now. Well, we own all, all three of these, one way or the other. And the uh, sectors that do well coming out of bear markets and recessions include materials uh, like paper, so I like uh, Pope and Talbot, and also health care, and a big health care stock that's been beaten up but has no bad, really bad things is, uh, is SmithKline Beecham, as far as I know. And I think everybody should have an energy stock, and I think Suncor is a unique stock. It's Canadian, it's, uh, it's oil sands, it's uh, not subject to hurricanes or wars, and it has more value per barrel or per dollar invested rather than, than any other big oil company. Your energy as always is admirable. Thank you. And now a quick correction. Due to a production error when last week's guest Donald Yachtman mentioned the stock of Liberty Media, we inadvertently showed not the correct chart, which you see here, but that of another company, Liberty Corporation. We do apologize. And speaking of charts, our affection for you and your views is always off the charts. So let us hear from you here at Lou at CNBC.com. And now let's go over and meet tonight's special guest, Jean-Marie Evian. Jean-Marie, nice to see you again. Welcome. Luis, good to see you. Always a pleasure. My old friend Jean-Marie Evian has sometimes erred on the gloomy side, but he has also been, as I called him years ago, one of the best companions a cautious American investor can have on financial voyages abroad. And boy, or should I say Garçon, has this French-born money manager who has been compiling a distinguished record in money management since coming to the U.S. in 1968 been looking good lately. 
He and his co-manager were named Morningstar's International Stock Fund Managers of the Year in 2001. His $1.9 billion First Eagle Sojen Global Fund has been making money consistently. And his First Eagle Sojen Gold Fund has been the best of the bunch in that recently hot category. John Marie, are you...